All right, hi there. So in this video, I'd like to explore this sort of mysterious and very important vector field that I've written up here at the top. So this is, in some sense, a vector field that rotates, that spins to the in a counterclockwise fashion. However, it is curl-free. V is curl-free. Note that in both of the components, P and Q, we have a, a denominator for which is zero at the origin. X squared plus Y squared is zero when X and Y are zero and zero. So I'd like to sort of explore the idea of what is the value of the work integral over a closed curve over a closed curve C, where C is going to be traversed counterclockwise. Okay. So really quick, right off the bat, here is an incorrect argument that says that every single curve will be zero. And I should add where C encloses, encloses, origin. Okay, so some people on the first guess might say they might compute curl of v is zero, thus by Green's theorem. In my classes I've called this Stokes theorem because Stokes theorem is the more general version, that the integral of c v dot t ds should be equal to the double integral of curl of v over the region enclosed in a counterclockwise fashion <clears throat> by c, call that r. So the picture is, uh, here is my curve in green, that is c, and it encloses a region r. And you might be tempted to say, well, R is my purple region, and I know that curl is zero everywhere, so my right-hand side of this equality looks like R, you're double integrating the constant function zero over R with respect to area, and so you think that should be equal to zero. This is faulty logic because the vector field is not defined at this singular spot at the origin. So this is a signif this is significant. Significant as a singularity. So I would like to um, express in this video really what this vector field is trying to tell us. So let's just define a function f on the plane minus the origin. So this function is defined everywhere. In fact, not, not just on the origin, but defined um, on the plane without the positive x-axis, where x and y goes to the theta value. So let me just explain what I mean for a second. I'm saying in every point where we've excluded the origin and the positive x-axis, I'm going to mark a point and what is the value of f at that point? I'm saying f is theta. So I've kind of drawn that to be pi over four. So I would say f at the point one, one would be pi over four. Okay, that's fine and dandy. Could be f at the point zero comma one up here, would probably be pi over two. Let's find something else. Let's do f of, um, let me think, negative one comma root three, somewhere up here, I think, maybe like that. This is going to be pi over the two pi over three. Okay, so this function is smooth. It's, it's differentiable um, and it increases in increments in these radial rays. Now it's not continuous over my green slice right here because there's a discontinuity. As I start right here, I'm at theta equals zero. And by the time I sort of work my way around over here, 
I have theta equals something close to 2 pi. And so as I complete my loop, I jump down from 2 pi to 0. So um, it's important to note that f is not continuous CTS over the green line. This is just the positive x axis. Now you might be wondering, why am I talking about this weird function? It's the function that inputs two, uh, inputs a pair of numbers, x, y, and outputs the theta at that location. Why am I talking about this? The reason why is that where defined, so where f is defined, I actually have that the gradient of f equals v. And we know that's a very powerful thing from the fundamental theorem of calculus for work integrals in calculus three. Okay, so let me just do a really quick demonstration of why this is true. You already know why this is true, then we can, you can skip the next piece. But I want to explain, so I want to give an explanation for why it's true that the gradient of f equals v, where v is this good old vector field right here. Okay. This is going to be where f is defined. So let me just do, I mean, you can kind of believe that this is going to be true, because if you look at the original function, it's the original vector field. Oh, I haven't even drawn it. I'll draw it over here. If you draw the original vector field, I'll draw it in green, that it looks like this uh, rotation. It looks like this counterclockwise rotation. So if that makes sense that the gradient of f will be v because if the gra if f is defining theta then the gradient of theta is going to describe where to move to increase theta most rapidly so how do you increase theta standing at a point p you're going to move it in this radial direction so that means that this vector is probably the gradient of theta all right okay let's come back over here let's show algebraically why it's true so let's get a formula for f. Okay, at least in the first quadrant, I can make the following observation. So I mean, in the first quadrant, I'm, I'm staying away from this, I'm staying away from this, I'm just in this zone right here. That's the only points that I'm considering. If I take a point x comma y, I wanna get a formula for theta. I can do this in the following way. I can draw a triangle, and I can label the pieces of the triangle. We know theta is the angle measured from the positive x-axis, so I can measure theta as this angle right here. I know my, my height is y and my run is x, so I can tell you that, um, well, we can look at tangent for a second and say that the, the, the tangent of theta is, um, tan, soka, toa, opposite over hypotenuse, is opposite, not hypotenuse, this is, I make this mistake all the time, is opposite over adjacent. Now, opposite is over here is the height, which is y, and the adjacent is the, you know, run, I don't want to use purple, I'll use, I don't want to use green, let's use uh, blue, okay, over run, that's adjacent, I'll thicken that up. So the adjacent is x. So this tells us we have the following formula that tangent of theta equals y over x. And in fact, this tells us that theta is equal to the arctan of y over x. Cool. So that tells us that, you know, f is theta is arc tan y over x. So the most suspicious thing that I've said so far is that the gradient of f actually equals v. But now in quadrant one, I have a formula for x.
sorry, not a formula for x, but a formula for f. So in quadrant one, f of xy is equal to the arctan of y over x. And so I'm claiming this piece up here, that the gradient of this function is equal to v. So let me prove this to you. Let's, let's actually explore why the gradient of f turns out to be v. Well, the gradient of f is the partial of f with respect to x and the partial of f with respect to y. So let's compute both of these. So partial f, partial x is the following. I've got to take the partial derivative of this puppy right here, and you'll see that, well, you've got to use a uh, derivative of arctan and then chain rule to multiply this thing through. So arctan, if you remember, <clears throat> I'll, put up this, I'll put this up in the corner that d du of arctan u is equal to 1 over 1 plus u squared. So we're going to use this fact in the upper right corner to say that the first I'm going to use the arctan derivative. So this is 1 over 1 plus y over x squared multiplied by the derivative of y over x with respect to x. So uh, I've got a y as a constant times a negative 1 over x squared. Well, let's factor all this through. The numerator, I've got negative y. On the denominator, I have 1 plus y squared over x squared. And I'm going to be multiplying this whole denominator by a 1 over x squared. <clears throat> what happens as this factors on through? Um, the, it hits the 1, so I'll keep the numerator the same. Oh, and uh, and I'll use I'll distribute this to the left, and I'll get a x squared and x squared, and I will multiply it by this term right here. I'll actually be getting a y squared. Lo and behold, this is p of x y, where v is p q. So we've done half of the work. We've argued that the we've argued that the we're trying to show this blue highlighter up here. We're trying to show this thing, oops. And so we've argued that the first coordinate of the left is equal to the first coordinate of the right. We've shown that the partial derivative, this shows that partial f, partial x actually equals p, where they're both equal to negative y over x squared plus y squared. Let's move over to the next page and just check that the second component is correct. So let's, compute partial f partial y and let's hope it equals q where q is equal to x over x squared plus y squared let's show how that happens so partial f partial y remember f is arctan y over x this is even a little bit easier not to say that the first one is easy but First, I have to do the arctan derivative, which is 1 over 1 plus y over x squared. We're thinking this is the u. But then I've got to multiply by the derivative of the inside using chain rule. So chain rule says, um, and we're using y. So what is the partial partial y of y over x? Think of this as 1 over x times y, where this is a constant. So that means this should just be 1 over x as my constant. All right, so I'm going to do some black magic and multiply the top and bottom by x. I'm allowed to do this because I'm in the first quadrant where x and y are non-zero. So, well, I'd be, I'd be in trouble anyway if x were equal to 0 by the fact that I've got this thing going on right here, but that's beside the point. <laughs> and uh, I've got uh, an x on the denominator there, so x is certainly non-zero. So I'm going to multiply both sides by, sorry, I'm going to multiply the top and the bottom by x, and I'll get an x on top, and by uh, maintaining this piece, I've got my 1 plus y over x squared. I'm just keeping that there. I'm keeping my blue x but remember, I'm, I'm doing a, an x on top and an x on bottom. So this means I should be adding an x down here. 
So this is x over 1 plus y squared over x squared times 1 over x squared, where this piece comes from combining this. And I've got x over, as I distribute this in, oops, come on, go backwards, whatever, x over x squared plus y squared. Lo and behold, this is the q, and I will highlight at the top, this is what we were hoping to see. We were hoping to see that partial f, partial y, was equal to q. So the whole story is that the gradient of f in quadrant one turns out to be equal to negative y over x squared plus y squared, comma, x over x squared plus y squared. This was a lot of work. We have to take the derivatives of both components, sorry. We had to take partial derivatives of the single function f, but we see that this equals v of x, y, which was the very first, which was the vector field we're investigating in question. Okay, so I've convinced you, I've convinced you that v is the gradient of f, and f is merely theta, in the first quadrant. You can use similar arguments using like the Soka Toa business over here. This is the Soka Toa to show that you have V is the gradient of theta in other quadrants. For example, for the um, second quadrant, you'll probably give F as an expression of negative arc tan x over y. That'll probably work as a good theta for you. This is theta. And you'll find this by Soka Toa. Not so, not ka, but Toa you'll find, because arctan uses rise and run and theta. There's a pretty good relationship between x, y, tan, and theta there. But the idea is, is that I want to argue that the work integral of v uh, dot t ds, this is a work integral over some sort of closed path. So this is my c, is going to somehow be equal to 2 pi. This is what I'm trying to tell you. There are lots of different ways to see it, but now that you know that v is morally this is supposed to be squiggly equal, is morally the gradient of function theta, you can see that you can sort of use a fundamental theorem of calculus to say that, well, because I know V is the gradient of theta, then probably as C is a path from point A, to point B, then the work integral of V dot T dS C should be equal to, by the fundamental theorem of calculus for work integrals, should be um, F of B minus F of A. Here, remember, F is theta, so you should say, uh, you should have something like theta of B minus theta of a, and this is the point where you have to think about it a little bit. Um, you have to pick whether you're going to use zero or two pi at each stage. So this is, this is kind of where it gets, it's hairy, and this is where I try to, I'm trying to tell you sort of the intuition of what's going on. I'd say that theta at b, well, if you've started at a, where a is theta is zero, you really have, as you've walked around that origin, you've racked up about two pi in theta's worth of angle. So I'd really say that theta of b is two pi, whereas theta at the origin, a, is equal to zero. Making this difference equal to two pi minus zero. You'd be in trouble if you called both a and b theta equals theta equals zero.
although they both do have angle equals zero, there's something happening with the angle. And there's something that this integral is noticing as you're moving across, a, as you're kind of increasing your angle from zero to two pi. And that's kind of, although this, this, although this is curl free, this vector field is curl free, and you can use the fundamental theorem of calculus, where the fundamental theorem of calculus can only be used in the curl-free setting, you sort of have this, this issue at the origin. And the issue at the origin is allowing you to rack up two pi's worth of integral as, as you move from, you know, from A to B. And that's kind of what's hiding in the singularity at the origin and I, I hope this has helped people in any way so use this with what you will all right